Welcome back to another Harbour Unbox video. Today we're going to be checking out the new Ryzen 5 1600X and 1500X CPUs to see how they compare with their closest Intel rivals. Today AMD is releasing a grand total of four new Ryzen 5 models, though for this video we will be just looking at two of them. The 1600X that we will be reviewing is accompanied by a second 6-core part, the plain 1600X, which comes clocked roughly just 10% lower, but given all Ryzen CPUs are unlocked, they are essentially the same product. So while the 1600X is priced at 250 US, keep in mind you should be able to achieve pretty much the same performance out of the non-X model for $220. Uh, in either case, these 6-core CPUs will be doing battle with the Core i5-7600K or possibly the $210 non-K model, but for this video we will be focusing on the 7600K. Then we have the 1500X, which sounds quite similar, especially given how the 1800X and 1700X are essentially the same CPU. However, the 1600X and 1500X are very different. Whereas the 1600X is a six core part, the 1500X is actually a quad core. It's worth noting though that SMT is still enabled, so like a mainstream Core i7, the 1500X offers four cores with eight threads. I'm not going to go into too much detail here as we have already discussed the Ryzen 5 specifications in a previous video and I'll link that in the video description. Rather than go over all that again, let's jump to the benchmark results. Please note that the 1600X was tested with DDR4-3200 memory, while the 1500X has been downgraded to 2933 memory. The memory controller on my 1500X chip that I received wasn't good enough to handle 3200 memory, so I was forced to lower the memory speed. Meanwhile, the Intel lock chips were tested using DDR4-3200 memory, while the locked model, being the Core i5-7500, was tested using DDR4-2400. AMD has provided a new test platform for our review using the ASUS Prime B350 Plus motherboard, DDR4-3200 memory, and a fresh install of Windows on a Samsung 960 Evo SSD. Therefore, I threw out all my previous testing results for both the AMD and Intel CPUs and started again from scratch. Let's see what we found. Here we see that memory bandwidth performance has improved using the most up-to-date BIOS on the ASUS B350 motherboard. The Ryzen CPUs are now good for 35 gigabytes per second. Previously, we were seeing around 32 gigabytes per second with DDR4-2933 memory. This means even with lower rated memory, the Ryzen CPUs are delivering at least 10% more bandwidth than the KB Lake CPUs. This will hand the 1500X a massive advantage over the Core i5-7500 in memory intensive workloads as it has over 40% more bandwidth at its disposal. Using Cinebench R15 to measure single and multi-threaded performance, we once again find extremely impressive figures from the Ryzen CPUs. The 1600 lays waste to the 7600K's multi-threaded score, essentially doubling it. That said though, for single workloads, the higher clock speed of the Core i5 means the 1600X is 11% slower here. Moving to the 1500X, and we find it's just 15% slower than the 7700K in the multi-threaded test and 21% slower when looking at single thread of performance. However, when compared to the similarly priced 7500, the 1500X was 45% faster in the multi-threaded test and 6% faster in the single-threaded test. So as we found when testing Ryzen 7, this points to Ryzen 5 offering vastly superior productivity performance when compared to competing Intel CPUs. The 7-zip benchmark shows similar margins to what we just saw in Cinebench R15. The cool thing here, however, being that this is a real-world application, and the gains here can be enjoyed by the average user. There are two tests here. One measures the performance when compressing files to an archive, for example, and then decompressing, which basically measures the performance when extracting from an archive. It's interesting to note that Intel's compression and decompression performance is very similar. However, AMD CPUs are much faster at decompression than they are at compression, though to be fair, they are anything but slow at either. In fact, the 1600X crushes even the 7700K in both tests. It's 15% faster when compressing and 44% faster when decompressing. Then when compared to the 7600K, it's over twice as fast when decompressing. Then we have the 1500X, which is over 60% faster than the 7500 in the decompression test. This is obviously a massive difference, and the vast majority of users will find themselves doing much more decompression work than they will compression, so this is a big win for Ryzen. 
The Monte Carlo simulation is an old favourite and this heavy Excel workload crushes weak CPUs. It's also a great test for measuring multi-threaded performance as it uses all available threads. We've seen it do a good job of utilising a dual Xeon configuration with 40 threads. I realise that most of you watching this video are more interested in gaming performance than heavy spreadsheet work, but this is a good indicator of real-world performance in applications that utilise multiple threads. Here we see that the 1600X is 10% faster than the 7700K and 62% faster than the 7600K. Meanwhile, the 1500X was 20% slower than the 7700K, but 18% faster than the 7600K and 61% faster than the 7500. So when compared to similarly priced Intel CPUs, Ryzen 5 delivered around 60% more performance in this application. Finally, before jumping to the games, let's check out Premiere Pro CC. This is a different workload to my previous Premiere Pro tests. It's still a 4K video export, but we have reduced the length of the video to speed up the time that the test takes. The 1600X took 241 seconds to complete the workload, making it 31% faster than the Core i5 7600K. Meanwhile, the 1500X matched the 7600K, making it 22% faster than the 7500. So another excellent application result for AMD. Now for the games, and this is where things tend to get a bit messy with Ryzen. First up we have Battlefield 1, and here both the 1800X and 1600X fall short of the 7600K's 153 FPS average. However, if we look at the minimum frame rate, both are faster than the 7600K. In fact, here the 1800X matched the 1600K, while the 1600X was just 4% slower. The 1500X on the other hand loses out to the Core i5-7500 for both the minimum and average frame rate. Still, it is possible to overclock the 1500X for greater performance and we will look into this later in the review. Deus Ex Mankind Divided has been tested using the DX11 API at 1080p with the high quality preset. Here the 1600X matches the performance of the 1800X, though unfortunately both are slower than the 7600K. Almost 10% slower in fact when comparing the minimum frame rate. That said, the 1500X makes out quite a bit better, beating the Lock 7500 by a slim margin. The DX11 Hitman results are very competitive for the 1600X and 1500X, which is great as the 1800X didn't fare too well against the 7700K or 6900K, at least when looking at the average frame rate. I should note that the minimum results were very good. Moving on, the 1600X roughly matched the 7600K, while the 1500X was a good bit faster than the 7500. So a great result for the 1500X here. The plan was to include Mafia 3 to showcase how well Ryzen can perform in some games. Previously, this was a title where Ryzen 7 processors did very well, even beating the 7700K under certain conditions. However, this retest shows the 1800X to be quite far behind the 7700K. Something has changed with this title, the 1800X has taken a big hit, particularly to the minimum frame rate, and the same is also true for the 6900K. On the other hand though, the 7700K has gained quite a few extra frames, so it seems some optimization must have been done to make this title less demanding on the CPU, though this could be down to improvements made by Nvidia's display driver. At this point, I'm just not sure. I believe the game was patched last week, but there was no mention of any performance changes. The Nvidia driver has also been heavily updated since the previous testing was conducted, but improvements were mostly made to DirectX 12 performance. So, I was expecting the 1600X to easily beat the 7600K here, and for the 1500X to demolish the 7500. Rather, the performance was very competitive amongst these processors, and again, something must have changed here. Moving to Ashes of the Singularity, we see that the 1800X is able to close in on the 7700K for the normal batch test. That said, it does slip away in the heavy batch test. Moving to the new Ryzen 5 models, and we see the 1600X looking very competitive alongside the 7600K. Meanwhile, the 1500X has no trouble dispatching the locked Core i5 7500, providing almost 10% more performance in the normal batch test. So, another strong result for AMD's new affordable quad-core CPU. I know there are a few viewers who will rake me over the coals if I don't include any AMD GPU testing. I'm sure you guys want to see RX 480 Crossfire testing, but right now I can't do that. Still, the R9 295X2 should deliver similar results. That being said, I instantly wish I never bothered. 
Testing with Ashes of the Singularity and a few other titles such as Deus Ex, Mankind Divided, delivered very disappointing results. I'll just show you the Ashes testing. The Deus Ex uh, findings were even worse for the Ryzen CPUs. Oddly, the Core i5-7500 was quite a bit faster with the R9-295, while the 1500X was quite a bit slower. Anyway, I promise I'll revisit the AMD GPU testing in extreme depth once Vega arrives. When it came time to overclock, we found that our 1600X sample was good for 4.1 GHz, while the 1500X sample hit the wall at 3.95 GHz. Testing with Premiere Pro saw the 1600X boost its performance by 9% once overclocked, making it slightly faster than the stock Core i7-7700K, and not much slower than the stock 1800X. The 1500X performance, on the other hand, was improved by just 4%, and this was a disappointing result. Mostly because overclocking the 7600K led to an 18% improvement, taking just 269 seconds to complete the workload. That said, the 7600K is a more expensive CPU and requires a third-party cooler as well. When compared to the similarly priced Core i5-7500, the overclock 1500X was 28% faster, so that is another strong result for AMD. The overclock 1600X squeezed out a few more frames in Battlefield 1, though the result wasn't worth getting excited over. The 1500X on the other hand was a little more impressive here, and the overclock did allow it to just outpace the Core i5-7500. Here the 1600X gained 6% more performance in Ashes of the Singularity once overclocked, allowing it to beat the overclocked 7500K, at least when comparing the average frame rate. Meanwhile, the 1500X is now 14% faster than the 7500, hitting 73 FPS on average, so again, a good result for the 1500X. Looking at the power consumption figures when running the Cinebench R15 multi-threaded test, I have to say the Ryzen CPUs don't look particularly fuel efficient. The 1600X pushed total system consumption 64% higher than that of the Core i5-7600K. However, here we need a bit more context. Remember, the 1600X was almost 100% faster in this test, so increasing total system consumption by just 64% to deliver twice the performance is actually very impressive. The 1500X wasn't quite as good as its configuration consumed 66% more power, while it was only 45% faster. Still not a bad result, though the 1500X does look quite inefficient in this test when compared to the 7700K. Here we have the maximum power consumption figures for the Excel tests, as well as the system idle figures. As you can see, the idle results are all much the same, hovering around 60 to 70 watts. Again, the power consumption figures on their own are a bit misleading. Here the 1600X can be seen pushing system consumption 34% higher than that of the 7600K configuration, and that looks pretty bad. Yet it did complete the test 62% faster. So while it consumed more power, it completed the test much faster, actually making it the more efficient processor here. The same is true for the 1500X. It consumed 33% more power than the 7500, while delivering 61% more performance. As is often the case, power efficiency goes right out the window once you start overclocking and increasing voltages. If you care about efficiency, then overclocking Ryzen 5 processors might not be a desirable option. The performance gains were quite slim, and yet we see the 1600X increase total system consumption by a staggering 49%. Hard to believe, but it's true. The 1500X increased consumption by a more reasonable 30%, though at best we only saw about half that margin in performance gains. By the way, this power-hungry overclocking stuff isn't just an issue on AMD side. The 7600K sucked down 42% more power once overclocked, but we only saw performance gains of up to 20%. Now for the operating temperatures using the stock AMD coolers. Actually, I should note that the Ryzen 5 overclocking was done using the Wraith Spire for the 1500X and the Wraith Max for the 1600X, but I will talk more about CPU coolers more towards the end of the video. Out of the box, the 1500X idled at 35 degrees and peaked at 68 degrees when using the Wraith Spire. Overclocked to 3.95 GHz, those temperatures did shoot up quite a bit. The idle was now at 42 degrees, but it was the load temp of 88 degrees, which was getting a bit roasty. That said, the heatsink wasn't uncomfortable to touch, and while audible, the fan wasn't screaming loud. The 1600X paired with the Wraith Max idled at 36 degrees and maxed out at 61 degrees at the stock frequencies. That said, when overclocking it did hit 90 degrees under load, so that's getting a bit too hot in my opinion. Though keep in mind I'm using a power bug type program to stress the CPU, so when gaming you won't see temperatures get nearly as high 
as these for the most part. Keep in mind though, while the 1600 does come with the Wraith Spire, the 1600X that we have for testing here doesn't come with a cooler at all. For this reason, I strongly suggest buying the cheaper 1600 over the 1600X. Of course, if you are going to seriously overclock either six core model, you're probably better off investing in a large tower style cooler or an all-in-one liquid cooler. These are of course mandatory items for the Core i5-7600K. Okay, so now to make sense of the data and try and work out which CPU it is you guys should buy. In my opinion, priced at $250 US, the 1600X is an exceptionally good buy and a fantastic alternative to Intel's Core i5-7600K. The problem with the 7600K is that for the same price, you do only get four cores. Granted, they are exceptionally good cores that can be pushed quite high through overclocking, and in most games they are very efficient, but it is still just a quad core. As good as the 7600K's gaming performance is, the 1600X still offered more consistent performance in games such as Battlefield 1, and of course here, although the averages were lower, we were still pushing over 120 FPS at all times. It also made out better in Ashes of the Singularity Escalation and provided similar performance in Hitman. Even in games such as Mafia 3 and Deus Ex Mankind Divided, where the 1600X trailed the 7600K, the margin wasn't exactly significant. So out of the box gaming performance right now is very similar. What isn't similar is the productivity performance. It really doesn't matter what the application is. There will be hundreds that mimic what we saw in 7-Zip and Excel, for example. For content creation, the 1600X is a beast at the price point, roughly matching the 7700K. Even if we take overclocking performance into account, the 7600K can't live with the 1600X when it comes to productivity. Likewise, once more games start to utilize Ryzen as well as these applications are, the 7600K is going to be left well behind. For me, Ryzen 5 also feels much more like an enthusiast grade product thanks to the unlocked clock multiplier, overclocking support on not just the flagship chipset but also the affordable B350, and of course that impressive box cooler for the 1600X which offers quite a bit of overclocking headroom. On the contrary, the 7600K requires a reasonably expensive flagship Z series chipset if you plan to overclock, and don't forget there's no box cooler at all. That's right, you're paying more for an unlocked K model, and Intel does you the favor by keeping the metal. So right away, you can tack on around another $20 to $30 US onto the price tag for a basic air cooler. There's also around a $20 premium for the motherboard as well. If we combine the CPU price, entry-level motherboard supporting overclocking, uh, and the cooler, we find the 1600X actually ends up costing 8% less than the 7600K combo, and not the 4% more you'd pay for just the CPUs. Of course, if you opt for the vanilla 1600 like I suggest, then you're saving a little over 15% on the core components. That's pretty insane for a 12-thread setup opposed to a quad-core. If you thought the 1600X seemed like a pretty obvious choice, then sit down, the 1500X is a no-brainer. You might think quad-cores in 2017 are old news, and well, they kind of are. However, with its SMT support, the 4-core, 8-thread, 1500X does very well for itself, and at just 190 US, it's exceptional value. The alternatives for around the same money are the Core i5-7400 or the 7500 which we tested, and as you just saw, the 1500X had no trouble dispatching Intel's budget quad-core. For gaming, they were quite evenly matched for the most part, though of course at no additional cost, the 1500X can be overclocked while it's impossible to squeeze any more performance out of the locked Intel chip. Again, when it came to productivity workloads, the 1500X was in a different league. As I said when discussing the 1600X, the 1500X really is a chip that will be appreciated by enthusiasts as it can be overclocked and can take advantage of faster memory. Something else I should also quickly note is that gaming performance will also be considerably more competitive with a mid-range to high-end graphics card, something like the RX 480 or GTX 1060, up to say the GTX 1070. The upshot being that in CPU-bound games, Ryzen will still have an advantage thanks to its additional resources, and therefore in those situations will pull ahead of the 7600K. Overall, I think I am more impressed with the Ryzen 5 series than I was a month earlier with Ryzen 7, for the simple fact that there is less competition at these price points. Intel has done a pretty poor job of looking after enthusiasts, particularly those on a budget, and this is where these new Ryzen 5 chips really hit hard. This makes me think how incredible the Ryzen 3 range is going to be in terms of value. You might scoff at $130 to $150 US quad-core that lacks SMT support, 
But remember, the upgrade path here is very rich. The AM4 motherboard that you purchased today should still be able to support AMD processors all the way to 2020. At least that's the plan. So the option to move from an affordable quad core that you buy today to something much more substantial or at least capable in a few years time should be possible. And this is the reason why I'm so keen on the 1500X. And that brings me to the end of my release day Ryzen 5 coverage. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And remember, if you want to get your hands on an incredibly cool custom-built Ryzen 7 gaming PC, then be sure to enter our competition. I'll throw the link in the video description below. Uh, there's also more Ryzen 5 coverage to come on the channel, so this will not be the end of it. I now have the 1600 and 1400 on hand, so expect to see some testing done on them soon. I'm your host, Steve. Catch you again next time.